Oggi mi dispiace in inglese. Um. Um. I'm going to uh, give you a small history lesson uh, today, um, uh, just to explain that um, what you're experiencing today is nothing new. Uh, arguably, this has been a problem that has affected Europe for the last 150 years. And the only difference is now that um, it's in the context of something we call the European Monetary Union. Before I start, let, let me uh, explain that um, I have worked in the financial markets. But when I started in the financial markets, we were trained to believe that finance was something that was uh, the handmaiden of industry and not the other way around. So I have never played any role in creating these uh, financial Frankenstein products like uh, credit default swaps. I, I want to make that clear. Um, th there is an expression uh, uh, called Gresham's Law, which states that bad money drives out good. Some of us who stay in finance uh, are trying to bring back the good money and drive out the bad. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the, the, the problem that you face today in the, in the European Monetary Union. Okay. When you join the Euro, uh, as Stephanie Kelton has already explained, you gave up your sovereign currency in favor of, of a new currency called the Euro. So in a sense, national central banks uh, obtain reserves from the European Central Bank for clearing purposes and the European Central Bank in turn is prevented from buying the public debt of the governments directly. So in a sense uh, you have surrendered your national sovereignty, your relationship to the European Central Bank is similar in many respects, uh, in all respects in fact, to an American state or an American provinces to the central bank. You, have a, uh, you are a user of a currency, but you no longer create your currency, and you have therefore lost your sovereignty. Now, uh, the, 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 the reason why this was done, there may have been noble, historical reasons behind it. Uh, there was a desire to avoid the horrors of uh, what we experienced from two world wars. And there was an ideal of creating a broader United States of Europe. But ultimately, uh, the house, this United States of Europe that we are trying to create is built on very faulty foundations. And this faulty architecture is at the root cause of today's problem. This is not a fault of Italy as a lazy Mediterranean profligate, as, say, the Germans like to indicate. That, that is a myth being propagated by today's financial elites, but it has no bearing in reality. Okay, so here's the history lesson. One could argue that the last 150 years has been a history of trying to deal with the so-called German problem. Now, when I say that there's a German problem, I'm not trying to suggest that there is a problem with the German people. Uh, 
and I'm not trying to reduce this to crude caricatures like we've seen recently in some of the papers uh, where, for example, Angela Merkel has been appearing in Nazi uniforms. I'm not trying to say that there's a problem in those terms. What I'm trying to suggest is that we have a, had a problem of a country that has been historically much more dominant economically and politically with its, uh, than its neighbors. And we are attempting to resolve that problem in various different forms. Now, in, in, in the period of 1865 to 1870, it, it, is, it was very, very similar in many respects to the period we had in the aftermath of the fall of the Berlin Wall. We had a severely divided uh, continent, and even Germany itself was a uh, series of smaller uh, principalities which were gradually unified into one larger country during that period. Now, that, that cr the creation of that nation state did not originally cause any problems. And, and it didn't because of the skillful diplomacy of Bismarck, uh, who managed to keep uh, German aspirations in line um, and, and, and control the imperialist impulses of uh, the, his, the Kaiser. Unfortunately, uh, Bismarck ultimately retired and uh, the rest was history. Ultimately, the expansionist impulse of the, uh, the Kaiser le led to the uh, disaster of World War I. And in the aftermath of that, we tried the first, uh, the, we, we had the first way of dealing with the so-called German problem. It's what I call the Carthaginian solution. We uh, tried to destroy Germany, punish them. We implemented very harsh reparations. And, and we occupied large parts of their country. And it is ironic in many respects that the very policies that uh, the Allies imposed on Germany in World War I, after World War I, are now being uh, introduced to some degree in German, by the Germans in countries like Greece, Italy, Portugal, and Spain. And we all know what happened with Fold. I'm not suggesting that we are about to uh, experience the rise of another uh, uh, Hitler, but certainly it is creating dangerous populist movements which risks uh, um, turning Europe into a much less civilized place in which to live and it leaves us with a much more difficult future. Now, uh, obviously, the, the, as I said, the Carthaginian solution created a, a huge backlash. We had the rise of Nazism and we had the Second World War. And uh, after the Second World War, we tried a different approach. We divided Germany. Uh, we, uh, uh, in, the, in the West, we had the French and American influence, and then East Germany became part of the Soviet bloc. And I think this, is, uh, this obviously could work for a short part time until Germany, uh, the force of history caused Germany to be reunified. But I think it was, it's important to realize that the foundation of the modern German state um, came during that period. Uh, we had a uh, Western government uh, that was fully committed to the freedom of the market, the free play of supply and demand, uh, and an importance where the state had to intervene to ensure that competition was not unduly hindered by cartels and monopolies.
It was Germany's social market economy. And this worked very, very successfully. It created the foundation of the, the, the modern Germany. And I think it's worth pointing out at that time that it was aided largely by American generosity in the aftermath of World War II. After the intense destruction of World War II, you didn't have American politicians lecturing the Europeans about how they were lazy, profligate, and had to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. The Americans responded with massive fiscal transfers equivalent to about 2.5% of American GDP each year for several years in the late 1940s. And this created the foundations for Europe's greatest period of growth. So it's important to realize we had fiscal surpluses recycled to create growth, not to repay debts, and certainly not to aid in the imposition of uh, financial reunification. Now obviously once uh, Germany is reunified, the whole issue of the German problem uh, arose again. Uh, there were some, such as uh, uh, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher in, in uh, Great Britain, who worried that we were going to create the uh, a, a new Fourth Reich. But her concerns were ultimately overrode or overridden by uh, the actions of what I would call the Europeanist wing in the uh, German government. The theory was that if Germany bound itself into uh, Europe fully, into a United States of Europe, that somehow the rest of Europe wouldn't have to worry about the, the so-called German problem. So we created the Treaty of Maastricht, which was negotiated in December 1991 and the following, signed the following February, where Germany's sovereign powers were further reduced in spite of the country's tremendous post-war economic success as an individual country. Now that meant that uh, Germany, uh, like uh, other countries, ultimately sur would surrender the, the Deutschmark. Um, Europe, in theory, was to have a common foreign and defense policy, and the frontiers of the European Union were going to be open. But there was a problem that, uh, was, uh, d that came in the, in the aftermath of the, the, the creation of the Euro. In spite of the many benefits offered by a single market economy, there was a question as to how many countries should actually join this new union. There were some who argued that the union should be small, it should be linked by a few countries that had common cultural, social and economic policies. This so-called small is beautiful school, of which the Bundesbank was a core member, argued that pooled national sovereignty, greater monetary and fiscal coordination were all more feasible where the countries involved had comparable social, political and economic structures and similar social outlooks. They argued that a large expansion of the Eurozone amongst a larger group of more heterogeneous nations with substantially different ideological and historical traditions would uh, complicate the uh, desire and drive to converge. By contrast, you had uh, advocates of what I call a big and broad Eurozone. 
And they argue that the bigger the Eurozone, the more likely the currency could compete with the decaying dollar standard as a viable reserve currency. Now, I think that's questionable, but the gamble was that uh, it, the euro was launched in the face of substantial regional economic disparities amongst the 12 founding members, both in terms of unemployment rates and per capita income levels. Um, and there was no corresponding fiscal authority to help alleviate these problems. The belief was that the longer these countries stayed under a common currency, the more they would converge. And that's been the gamble, and clearly it has not been successful. If anything, as we can see now, the disparities amongst the various countries has got worse, not better. So you have to ask, why did Germany ultimately agree to this larger structure in spite of the problems it's now created? And I think this is important because when you understand why Germany agreed to the bigger and broader union, it will help you to understand that they have been huge beneficiaries of the system as it stands today and that they are totally unjustified in criticizing countries like Italy, Greece, Spain or Portugal uh, for what has happened in its aftermath. Let me uh, go into that in a bit more detail because I think when we speak of Germany there are actually three Germanys we have to talk about. Germany number one is the Germany of the Bundesbank. This is, this is the uh, finance capital, the segment of the country which to this day retains huge phobias about the recurrence of Weimar style inflation. And they have an almost theological belief in hard money and a corresponding hatred of inflation. In their heart of hearts, this Germany would probably rather be on a gold standard. And as much as possible, they have tried to recreate a Eurozone in the model, with the model of a gold standard in mind. Germany number two is uh, what I would call the internationalist wing of the country. And they were led for a long time by Helmut Kohl. This group uh, is probably the foremost exponent of the idea that Europe can rid itself of the so-called German problem once and for all if Germany binds itself to a United States of Europe structure and continues to help institutions that move the EU broadly in this direction. I think it is questionable whether this vision has survived significantly beyond the tenure of Helmut Kohl himself, but this is certainly a, a, a part of the German political spectrum which still exists. Now, you could see the inherent tension between the two views. Um, Bundesbank Germany would never allow vague internationalist aspirations to dilute the goal of sound money, low inflation and fiscal discipline. Uh, you can almost imagine many of them looking askance at the Treaty of Maastricht and the uh, corresponding threat to their ideals of sound money. Which brings us to the key variable in German politics, Germany number three. And that's industrial Germany. This is the Germany of Siemens, Daimler-Benz, Volkswagen, the great steel and chemical companies, the capital goods manufacturers. These companies have clearly benefited substantially from the economic stewardship provided by institutions such as, the, such as the Bundesbank. But they also recognize that there were huge benefits entailed by a completely open and integrated European market, which was still the largest component of their sales. In their eyes, a currency union, even if it meant the admission of so-called fiscal profligates, such as Italy and Spain, minimize the threat of competitive currency devaluations. 
So the idea really was lock in countries like Italy and Spain into uncompetitive exchange rates, ensure that they could never use their currency to bear the burden of economic adjustment, and thereby entrench Germany's dominant export position in global trade. And this is why Germany today continues to run large current account surpluses, yet still has the audacity uh, to blame other countries, such as Italy and Greece, for running large deficits, when they use those deficits, in fact, to buy German uh, manufactured products. And I think that when the, the Germans uh, contend that they have uh, uh, been, uh, they're doing nothing but bailing out profligates and they have derived no benefit from the, the union, they crucially forget this, this component uh, of, of the, of the uh, European econ Economic Union. So I think what we have today is a dysfunctional marriage. The partners haven't grown together. Countries such as Greece, Portugal, Spain, Ireland have benefited from the illusion of economic convergence through lower interest rates and a stable currency. And when the European economy was growing, these markets indulged the fantasy that there was little to choose between, say, Greek bonds and German debt. And that's all now changed. It's obvious that these countries now are struggling to compete with a much more productive German economy. But because of fiscal austerity and the rules of the Stability and Growth Pact, they are given no means of, of competing and they are consigned to a form of indentured servitude. There is a feeling that somehow all of these countries have to get their labor costs down, they have to undergo what's known as an internal devaluation so that wages are crushed in order that they can export and compete with the Germans. The problem is this runs into what we economists call the fallacy of composition, which is to say that if we all deflate at the same time, there is no possibility of any of us growing. So there are two or three possible solutions. Well, one is to uh, admit that the whole thing is a failure and to go back to letting uh, 17 individuals' currencies bloom. Uh, this would have the virtue of restoring full fiscal sovereignty to all of the Euro member states and getting them away from the insane fiscal austerity policies that are now being advocated by the European Central Bank, the IMF, and a whole host of core countries such as Germany. Now, obviously, the economic dislocations uh, to the banking system, the payment system, both within Europe and globally, would be potentially catastrophic. It could make uh, the layman bankruptcy seem like a, a leisurely jog in the park by comparison. Now, what some people in Germany have suggested as solution number two, therefore, is that you have a two-speed euro. Uh, some have even argued that uh, Germany should withdraw from the euro, re-establish the Deutschmark, and the Europe euro itself can become a so-called soft currency. Well, first of all, there's the same problem in place. You have no mechanism to do this in an orderly way. And the question becomes, which countries join the, the hard currency block and which join the soft currency block? Uh, one, one country which I think is particularly vulnerable in this context is France. Uh, even though the French like to think of themselves as a disciplined Teutonic style country, uh, its economic and industrial profile is more like that of Italy. So it could face huge competitive threats from Italian industry were Italy to 
remain in a so-called soft currency bloc. It's also questionable whether the French populace as a whole could withstand the kinds of restraints to living standard which uh, the Greeks and the Spanish and the Portuguese are now expecting ex in order to stay in the Eurozone. This is, after all, the country that invented the guillotine. <laughs> so the third possibility, which I think is, uh, is uh, the most uh, uh, sensible for a longer term solution, is the United States of Europe. Now, uh, when I use the term United States of Europe, I don't mean to conjure up uh, an image that it has to be exactly like the United States. I'll use the example of my own country, Canada, because it sounds uh, like a lot less threatening example to many people. So let's take my, Canada, my country, Canada, as an example. Uh, I come from Toronto, uh, from the largest uh, province, Ontario. So imagine for a moment that the two largest Canadian provinces, Ontario and Quebec, were independent countries. If this were the case, uh, their debt burdens would consist of their existing debts plus their respecting shares of the current federal government debt. Their capacity to repay those debts would be determined by their respective tax bases, which is to say that each, each province's nominal GDP. So how would these debt burdens look? Well, if you look at the numbers today, Ontario and Quebec would each have debts that are higher than Spain and about the same as Portugal. <laughs> this reflects the growing significant social spending responsibilities of the Canadian provinces in areas such as healthcare and education, uh, which are the two largest source of government expenditures in Canada. Now, these spending commitments today are funded by fiscal deficits and debt issuance. Quebec and Ontario are also similar to Spain and Portugal in the new environment that I've described in that they would not control the currency in which they issue debt. That would be the Canadian dollar which would be issued by the Bank of Canada, that which in turn is a central bank that is now controlled by the federal government. So, given the poor fiscal fundamentals and its inability now to print money, these bonds would surely be skyrocketing in terms of the yields if they were independent countries. Well, clearly that's not the case. Yields on 10-year Ontario and Quebec government bonds are substantially lower than almost any European Monetary Union country right now. Why is that the case? because of fiscal federalism and the pooling of risk within the Canadian Monetary Union. There is an implicit understanding that the federal government will be, co will be covering the, the, the any, rescue any Canadian province that runs into trouble in the bond market. So that provides an indication that a monetary union, when it is complemented by a credible fiscal union, can actually work. Now, if Europe ultimately opted for this solution, then you would never have a situation where people worried about the creditworthiness of each individual country because it would all be aggregated into the broader Eurozone. Nobody would be worrying about so-called balance of payments deficits. Nobody would be talking about profligate countries, tax cheats, etc. If you look at, for example, the United States today, nobody knows and nobody cares if, say, a state like Texas runs a huge current account surplus with the other 49 states. Nobody cares if West Virginia is a recipient, a constant recipient of federal fiscal transfers because West Virginia is seen as a broader part of the United States. It's not a relevant consideration. That's ultimately what we have to do.
But I think in, 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 in obviously to get from there, from here to there, will take uh, several more years and the markets are not giving that time. So I would like to uh, suggest that there is a, an interim proposal which can be used to solve the immediate problems at hand. Unfortunately, as I said before, we do not have a United States of Europe Treasury in effect today in Europe. There is only one entity which creates euros, and that is the European Central Bank. And the European Central Bank, unfortunately, has to play a quasi-fiscal role, even though it resists this, because it is the only entity that actually can solve the underlying solvency problem which the European Union faces today. What uh, some of us have suggested, therefore, is for the European Central Bank to distribute trillions of euros annually to the national governments on a per capita basis. The per capita criteria means that it is neither a targeted bailout nor a reward for so-called bad behavior. The idea is that the distribution would immediately adjust national public debt ratios downwards while simultaneously easing credit fears and not necessarily triggering additional government spending. Once markets perceive that the countries are no longer heading for insolvency, they are more likely to uh, demand less in terms of interest rate, they are more likely to extend credit and to help the countries grow again. I liken this to a, a, a company which has a debt problem, which has a large rights issue in the capital markets. If that, com that company is able to successfully conclude a rights issue and is no longer perceived to be uh, l facing looming bankruptcy, it's much easier for it to uh, secure additional funding so that it can begin to grow again. Now, I would emphasize that what I am suggesting is not a means of dealing with the problem of aggregate demand deficiency in the Eurozone but it is a means of providing a credible way of restoring perceptions of national solvency so as to open up the capital markets again to countries like Italy so that they can engage in fiscal expenditures to support growth. Debt without growth is a non-starter as the Greeks are finding out. The reason why Greece, for example, can't grow today is that it's completely shut off from the capital markets for reasons of perceived insolvency. If you eliminate that problem and you create a situation where countries like Italy, Spain, Ireland, Portugal are viewed more like Ontario than a bankrupt state, then you're no longer under the strictures of the ECB's uh, enfor harsh enforced austerity programs. I will uh, elaborate on these proposals later on this afternoon, but I think it's uh, important to start to think uh, in these terms. The, the crisis is certainly forcing a much more radical approach on policymakers than they may have originally felt comfortable about. And I think that it's important to point out that uh, if this idea that I propose seems radical, it's worth recalling that uh, a few years ago, the idea of the European Central Bank buying sovereign debts in the secondary market as they do today was considered to be heretical. We were told that this was going to create massive inflation. Zimbabwe was around the corner and this was going to be a real problem. And of course, it hasn't been the case at all. So we can actually uh, see that the 
European Central Bank's balance sheet has expanded massively over the last uh, several months. Weimar hasn't come. So it's time, I think, uh, to dismiss these old economic shibboleths and make people realize that there is an alternative, and we'll try to sketch that out later, but I thought it was important first to place this in a historic context. This is a multi-year project, but we can start now. Thank you very much.